We're here today at the Age Management Medicine Conference, the 17th one actually, and I am Florence Comite, Dr. Comite. I have the opportunity to interview one of the leaders here at the conference, a fellow endocrinologist, Dr. Edwin Lee, who spoke on a, a, num a number of topics actually. And so I'd love to hear your thoughts on what you're doing at the conference, how you think we're doing. Oh, this, this conference is phenomenal. We have um, some amazing speakers here. Um, the one that you interviewed before, is, I, actually is Dr. Barry Sears, but uh, I'm going to be talking on a really hot topic uh, later this afternoon. It's called endocrine disruptors, and that's such a huge subject. Um, I think a lot of the, our chronic diseases in America and across the world has to do with endocrine disruptors. Uh, since 1940, we have thousands of chemicals, man-made, that have not been tested for safety, and that's the problem. We have a broken system where um, you can patent it and you can get it on the market, but uh, safety testing is very minimal. Safety testing seems to happen years later when there are problems that arise from it. Want to tell us a little more about what an endocrine disruptor is, and can you define it and delve into it a bit? Sure. Uh, very simple. Simply, an endocrine disruptor is a chemical that can disrupt the endocrine pathway. It can actually attach to the um, estrogen receptor or the androgen receptor, or it can actually um, stimulate it or basically inhibit it. Um, there's other ways that it can go. It can actually um, work on different, different sites of the pathway, but generally it's uh, the endocrine pathway, it's a very simple pathway, but if it gets disrupted and you have, let's say, xenoestrogens, a man can actually turn into a woman, or not physically like a woman, but uh, it can become um, very, very uh, estrogen-like. So the estrogen in the body, the xenoestrogens would act like an estrogen, so a man would be exposed to higher levels of estrogen than he would otherwise have. Correct. And if, you, if a man has too much uh, xenoestrogens, um, they're going to have low testosterone, they're going to have um, impotence, and they're going to have problems with uh, low T symptoms, and they're going to be very, very tired. So, Can you test for xenoestrogens? How exactly would one go about looking at whether you've been exposed to endocrine disruptors, and that's the cause of the complaints you hear in your patients? Yes, yeah, so I do testing, and you can test. Um, there are special labs that do um, endocrine disrupting or um, organic chl chloride pesticides and there's many different um, chemicals out there like parabens and PP, uh, BPA. So you, it's generally a blood test or a urine test but special labs can actually uh, check for it. Um, I, I like to use Genova Diagnostic. They basically have uh, a test that you can look at that. But it, um, Do they, you look at it in all individuals? Is that your recommendation? in terms of your patient population? I actually um, like to look at it, especially when I have a young male patient, because I don't want to really commit them to early testosterone therapy at a young age. So if they come in when they're 25, 30, I'm tr really looking for, after I kind of balance everything out and I cannot uh, basically get their testosterone naturally, then I'll look at other causes. Also heavy metals, which I won't be talking on this uh, lecture, but I'll be talking probably in April. Um, that's something that can actually cause low T, low testosterone. Interesting, yes. Well, there are a lot of other reasons for low T, such as depression, uh, drugs for, to treat depression, serious infections, because the testosterone axis with the brain is the most sensitive axis. So you and I both know that tends to fall out, but it can come back. So that's the, uh, the good news there. Tell me too, let, why don't we talk a bit about growth hormone? I know that's another specialty of yours and you're comfortable with looking at growth hormone values or IGF-1 and what the next steps might be if you want to give that uh, some thought. Sure, I'm actually a very big prescriber on human growth hormone, um, and uh, I don't give it out to everyone. I usually um, have a lot of my patients go through at least a year of follow-up with me, and I try to optimize everything else. So human growth hormone is like turbocharging the engine, and if you have four flat tires like adrenal fatigue, you have uh, basically low testosterone, insulin resistance, and your thyroid's off, it doesn't make sense to... Um, 
give human growth hormone right away. So I really want to optimize sleep and exercise, which is the top two things to get your growth hormone naturally. And there's a lot of secretagogues that you can use to basically get it up. And if everything fails and they have basically provocative testing that shows that you truly have low growth hormone, like a glucagon stim test or insulin tolerance test, then basically um, I, I will prescribe human growth hormone. What are the secretagogues that you like to use, just as a final question, especially of interest, I think, to attendees at the Age Management Medicine Conference here? Yeah, secretagogues, there's a lot actually on the exhibit halls that, uh, that they, they're out there. The one that I kind of like to use is called secretropin. Uh, it's a spray that you use underneath the tongue at bedtime. And it's basically amino acids uh, and other things to help basically release human growth hormone. What I really think down the road that's going to be the future is peptide therapy. And I'm doing a clinical trial in my office to see if uh, IGF-1 peptide therapy and IGF-1 with binding protein 3 actually really works. So I'm really excited about What's that. What's the route of administration? Yes, that would be amazing. It's actually subcutaneous. And uh, if this really works, um, human growth hormone may be of the past. Wow. Well, it's really been fascinating talking to you. I know that you're also a well-known author. You've written two books for adults, and now you're moving into the whole children's sector, wanting to educate the children. I think you have one book out there. I know I've seen it, The Amazing Heart, and I believe there's another on the horizon. Yes. Uh, well, it's going to be called Your Awesome Brain, which I'm really excited about. It's, it's, it's uh, basically in the printers right now, and um, I'm not quite sure exactly when we're going to do a national launch, but my whole idea about writing this children book series is to teach the next generation to basically help the children to uh, understand some simple reasons um, why eating too much sugar is bad for you, why you have to eat more vegetables, and you have to exercise daily. Uh, to have a healthy heart, and there are three other secrets on how to have an awesome brain. So it's really to encourage um, our next generation for healthy living, healthy eating, to have a healthy body, because it has not been taught when I grew up. It was not taught in medical school. I did not learn this in conventional medicine. I'm sure that uh, you weren't taught this in not at education. All. <laughs> so I'm really excited to you know try to um, start a series so that uh, children can be, uh, they can really understand why when we say don't eat too much sugar, why it's bad for you. <music>